Well, another beautiful fishing day in the Ozarks here. Uh, overcast, maybe a few storms, but none right now. Uh, and of course, anytime the water temperature is warming up like this, I start thinking about topwaters. And uh, another topwater, though, that that's really has a unique history for me is is a buzzbait. Uh, I didn't, we really wasn't even aware of, of but one type of buzzbait at this time, and that was what's called an inline buzzbait. And it's this particular one was like a Floyd buzzer, but it's called an inline. And I'll explain kind of that a little bit later. But I was fishing, a, going up to fish a tournament uh, at Cordell Hall BASS, but right before it, it was in Tennessee, but right before it, I went and fished a regional tournament in Illinois on Lake, on Wren Lake. And I was in a typical fisherman when you get there and you see a, a tackle store you've never been in, you're going to go in and look around. Uh, and I saw this lure that I'd never seen before. Uh, and I'd been traveling a lot. This was 1976 and I started my career in 74 traveling all over the country and believe me, all of us anglers go into every tackle store looking for something new. And I'd never seen one of these before. Uh, and it was called a lunker lure. And uh, so I bought a couple of them. And fished it a little bit during that event. Had one vicious strike on it, uh, but really didn't do much on Wren Lake. But I went straight from Wren Lake to fish the BASS tournament uh, at uh, Cordell Hall in Tennessee. You know, I'd never fished the lake before. The lake was fishing kind of tough. It, it had a 14 inch length limit on it. And uh, finally, about the third day of practice, and, and nobody was doing well, at least they weren't talking about it, I decided well, I'm gonna tie that, that, that buzz bait on. And so I tied it on and didn't go very far and I caught about a three pounder. And then I caught another one about two pounds. And that was, and those two fish alone were the best I'd done in practice. So I really committed myself to fishing this buzz bait during the event. Again, this was Cordell Hall 1976. And the first day of the event, I was uh, running down the lake, which I had to run about 30 miles down the lake to the lower end. That seemed to be where the best bite was. The water temperature was a little bit warmer than it was in the river where it was coming out from under another dam and was pretty cold. And I ended up catching 17 pounds that day and, and taking the lead. And my two biggest fish caught, come right at the end of the day. I was throwing b between two b bushes that were sticking out of the water, a dead, dead, dead bushes. And I came right between both of them. And this is one of the things you'll, you, everybody fought, fell in love with about the buzz bait. All of a sudden there was like this huge commode flushing under my bait. And, it's, and I caught a five and a half pounder, but he ran in both bushes before I did. Okay, and then I, I got him in, put him in, and the very next cast, the same thing. Another, you know, just huge strike. And it ran into one of the bushes, and I finally got it out, fortunately. And I was running out of time, and I'm going, dang, I gotta get back up the lake. It's gonna take me, you know, 45 minutes to run up there. Up there. And, and I went to make one more strike, and I threw the bait off and it went out in the lake. And so I just put my rod down, took off, ran up, ran back, and uh, I, uh, I did, I took the lead that day. And the next day, uh, I had a, another good day on the buzz bait. I caught one big one out of that same bush. Just, and, uh, but again, right at the end of the day, and I had a good lead, but right at the end of the day, I threw that one off. And here I'm gonna point out a rookie mistake. Most, what pound test, <laughs> put in your brain, what pound test line do most of you fish a buzz bait on? I was fishing it on 12 pound test line. That's how dumb I was back then. It just, again, this was my third year on the circuit. And now I had none left. And so I went around begging, trying to find somebody. Hey, do y'all have one of these? And they didn't even know what I was talking about. None of the guys in the tour, there was one guy that had, again, the, the Floyd buzzer. But uh, he only had one of them, and since I told him that's why I was catching them on, he wasn't about to lend that one to me. So the next day I went out and I uh, uh, tried to duplicate it, and I ended up catching one or two fish, I can't remember exactly, and ended up losing the tournament by two ounces. And uh, I, uh, again, it was a, a, a neat thing. All of a sudden I discovered this. We all love topwaters, you know, we all have our favorites and burning a spinnerbait or now, you know, throwing a topwater, but this was the topwater I'd never seen before. And all the way home, I kept going through all of my mistakes. 
uh, with, with this particular lure. Uh, shortly after that, though, I corrected those mistakes. I ended up second in that tournament. I lost it by two ounces. But in 1977, in the spring of 1977, I took this same exact bait, but I had plenty of them then, and I, had, I was throwing them on 20 pound test line. So I went to Percy Priest for the, the BASS Bass Champs Tournament, and I walked away with it using, using the buzz bait. I learned another thing about the buzz bait. I was fishing against submerged bushes and stuff and brush piles, and you'd always come through that, and the, way, the best technique was to throw it past it, come up to the bush fast, and then slow it down as slow as you could and come around the bush. And then you'd start out, you know, speeding it up again once you left the bush. And they would, they would blow up on it in the bush. But I also learned that if I didn't get, even get one or one would come up and swirl on it, I always, I would never leave that bush without pitching the worm back in there. So I, w I, I caught most of my fish on it, but there were some fish that didn't hit it. But I, I really felt like I was turning those fish on and you'd throw a worm back in there and catch, the, catch them. So I ended up again catching 30 bass uh, at the Bass Champs event and, and winning it. And then that's when this bait exploded over the country. Uh, because no, it really, I guess a few guys in Illinois fished it, but that's the only place I knew at that point in time that anybody ever fished, uh, you know, a buzz bait. Uh, uh, some little keys about it too is I am going to hold it up. See this skirt? You can't hardly find those skirts anymore. That's a, that's, that's a rubber skirt, what we call it, a light living rubber, a riot, live rubber, and it has a lot of action in the water. And um, that action is uh, really, to me, was key. Uh, but all of a sudden, the, the problem with these skirts was they would they start to stick together after they got in tannic acid or water, and then or in your tackle box, if you dropped a plastic worm on them, they would, they would just rot up and they would melt. Uh, and so eventually they started making this with that silicone skirt, which I was responsible for. And I'm, that's another story in itself. But uh, so nowadays you see a lot of guys going to uh, little frogs, soft frogs on the back. And you see this one has a trailer hook. Now in practice I don't run a trailer hook, but in the tournament I always run a trailer hook. Uh, in the beginning when nobody else was throwing the bait, they, they swallowed it. And you could fish it any time of the year, but then obviously after winning the tournament and uh, at Percy Priest, and the whole world caught on to it. More and more people started throwing it. And again, so I started due to the lack of action of the silicone skirts that eventually came on these baits. I would start putting, uh, you know, plastic versions of uh, this is like a Stanley Ribbit frog and a, a you know a zoom, a, a zoom frog. But so it's got a lot of different ways of fishing it now. It's got a lot of different colors. It's got a lot of different sizes. And we'll, I'll show you some of these techniques a little later on the water just to give you a visual of, of how the bait works. Here's a, a unique thing about the buzz bait that I was mistaken about and almost all the original anglers I think were mistaken. Because when you throw it out there, which I'll show on the water, it disturbs the surface quite a bit. And I thought that was translating actual audio sound underwater uh, and so one day my oldest daughter Brooke was out swimming in the lake and I said hey I'm gonna throw this over top of your head and you tell me if you can hear it underwater after several casts she comes up and said dad I can't hear nothing I can see it but I can't hear it to take it even to another step I uh, I, I, I got an a underwater microphone and sure enough no sound going under the water it, with the exception of one or two of the baits i did i tried different ones one of them had a squeaking sound and eventually discovered that squeaking sound was, would come from it wearing against the wire here and it would start making a squeaking sound after some wear so we as anglers hey we tie these things on the antenna of our cars driving to the lake we'd speed that process up and we'd get those that were squeakers so we'd have that underwater audio sound Later on, they'd come with what we call the clackers, which where the, this, the, the, the prop on this actually hits that when it's in the water, and it makes an underwater sound. So we, that's, again, we had kind of, as most anglers, we had to add an, an, another dimension to our ability to hopefully attract the fish. I'm just going to show you, this, this is a real versatile lure. Uh, it's, it's, I think one of the reasons I liked it so much, you didn't have to do a whole lot with it. It kind of did everything on its own. But here's a couple of little tips that seem to work better for me. And that, number one was, uh, obviously, if you'll watch, 
you, you can hear it. And that's what made me think originally that there had to be an underwater audio sound too. But without that squeaking and without that uh, uh, little other metal piece on there, you don't really get any underwater audio. But uh, here, I normally try to work it at medium speed, and I see a lot of guys work it real fast like that. And I'm not going to say it doesn't work at times. But one thing I really noticed helped me a lot was that when I come by a target, I, I slowed it down as slow as I could and yet keep it on top. And that seemed to really work work well. You have, even like this rock here, I would actually come at it and then I'd slow it down and I'd try to come around it. So it's just everybody has their own technique, but it's really a neat topwater sound. It's one of those things, even when my partners in the boat pick one up, I start to cringe because I know any minute I'm going to hear that commode flush and it's going to be a five, six pound bass that just sucked it under.